Well, good morning uh, from Santiago de Chile. I am Alejandro Berg, uh, cirujano dentista de la Universidad de Chile, and I welcome you to this first lecture uh, in a series of four uh, that will take us from this one, the very basics of uh, anatomy, histology, pathophysiology, up to our fourth one that would be diva systems. And in the middle, we'll go through planning and complications and everything else, sinus. So once again, welcome. Um, I want to start by reminding you that, well, I don't think I, I don't think I need to remind you there in uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, but I would like to tell you all, please be safe. Take care of your people. Take care of yourselves. And well, I hope we can go back to work as soon as possible. Actually, I was lucky enough to start working yesterday and it was unnerving and uh, somewhat complicated, but well, we, we have, we're back. And so uh, patients were happy. I was happy. Staff was happy. Uh, city still like a uh, ghost town, but well, this is what you get when you mess with uh, a virus. So a little about this presentation. Uh, this presentation is basically um, a reminder of what we all learned in dental school and after dental school. And uh, well, the idea is to get us all to a point where we are all speaking the same language, uh, remembering the anatomy, the histology, and the reasons why we are able to uh, perform sinus lifts in a predictable manner. And later on in the next uh, lectures, we will determine why we choose one technique over the other and which are the complications and which are the options and everything. So, so I know this lecture is a little slow like every basic lecture, but I uh, will appreciate if you can bear with me and we can all go into um, study mode. So, so we will all be, um, we will all be um, remembering stuff, which is needed for all of us to perform. Oh, Questions already? Okay, uh, no, comments. Not related to sinus, but you had mentioned you started your surgery today. Uh, what conditions were required by your local regulator? Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, okay, Dr. Teague, uh, our local, it is called Ceremi, it's like the FDA. Uh, it's, uh, it was very complicated. We have had to install protocols of, tiers. First uh, tier is outside the, well, we are in a building. Our office is inside a building. So the first tier is at the door of the, the building with uh, temperature measurements and uh, shoe covers and hair covers and, uh, uh, well, gel, alcohol. And second tier is at the door of the office. Uh, again, temperature and then we have to uh, make the patient a rinse with um, right now we're using uh, peroxide at zero point uh, at uh, five volumes uh, it should be at one volume but it's really complicated so we're doing it at five and uh, for a minute and then secondary boot covers uh, patient already has her cover and we use a little gown on top of his clothes and for the office once he gets in 
uh, well, social isolation, which means patients should come along, hopefully, and no more than two people at the office at the same time. Uh, we are all uh, dressed in surgical gowns, uh, N95, so uh, PFF3, FF3, yes. Uh, face shield, uh, cap. Uh, we use uh, short gloves and on top of the uh, surgical gown, large, uh, long gloves. And uh, well, uh, we have a all surface disinfected prior and post to the, the treatment of the patient. And well, that is regular standard for us. So, and we already had air filtration in our office uh, level one. So for us, it wasn't a change. It's so you're supposed to install. And w what we did was well, we cleaned all our, our, our uh, air conditioning systems with uh, special liquids and stuff. We hired a company and they cleaned all our systems. And that is pretty much it for now until they find something else to impose us. I hope that helped. Well, it's been, uh, oh, seven minutes. So, okay, uh, very simple. We're gonna go into the basics. Please send your questions or remarks or during the lecture, I will answer everything at the end. And uh, I will give you my, uh, my, uh, emails and WhatsApp if you need to contact me. So, here we go. And I hope to see you on the other side. Welcome to Part of Academy. This lecture is Sinus Floral Elevation Techniques from A to Diva, Part 1 of 4, The Basics. In this one-hour lecture, we will review all the basic elements needed to successfully perform sinus lifts in our patients. I am Dr. Alejandro Berg, oral surgeon from Universidad de Chile, and I've been an implant specialist for the last 25 years. I am a prosthodontist by trade, and that has always allowed me to evaluate my patients from a final restorative point of view. And we have incorporated several techniques in order to achieve long-term predictable success. So let's take a look at the most commonly used ones. Let's go for pros and cons, and then we can go into the basics. Partial removable prosthesis. Let's just say that if it's correctly executed, it is alternative is not the one I would choose or the one I would encourage my patients to go for, but it is a choice. So we have it in store if the patient decides he wants to go for that. Okay, so short and ultra short implants. Short implants, eight millimeters or less, ultra short implants, six millimeters or less, they are presented as alternatives to sinus intervention. And that would be cheaper and faster and easier than traditional sinus lift, being considered traditional sinus lift, lateral window, sinus elevation, grafting, and simultaneous implant placement. That is most likely true. While we have all seen long-term success reports. Longitudinal studies show that in conjunction with risk factors, such as pool bone quality, they have a higher tendency towards implant failure. And there are several studies that show that implants of 10 or less monometers, non regarding implantation zone, have a higher failure rate than longer implants. Misio-angulated implants. Well, this is a technique that allows you to use the anterior wall of the sinus as large cortical support to provide your implant with very good initial stability. 
and that is very good. But there is always a catch. Every angulated implant suffers from oblique forces while under loading. Oblique forces will induce rotational movement to your prosthetic screw and to your abutment. And that will beget micro movement. And micro movement, as we know, induces micro leakage. Micro leakage will induce a recurrent or permanent state of inflammation around the prosthetic area. And that will induce crestal loss and even per implant pathology. If you restore this with a distal cantilever, you will be inducing rotational compression on your distal implant and traction on your Michel implant. Most likely your Michel implant will be able to withstand this, but your distal implant will suffer all the loading. Actually, this x-ray is of a case of mine, a patient with CRS, and so no choice of sinus lift. And this belt-up implant right there is a replacement of an interport implant I placed 22 years ago. It failed. And so I am not very fond of this technique, but I use it when it's needed. Pterygoid implants. Well, they're called like that because you're supposed to insert the apical portion of your implant in the pterygoid process of the sphenoid one. And if you achieve this, in one swift movement, you would avoid grafting and avoid the need for a distal cantilever and improve the axiality of the loads, all of which is great. But several studies show that many times you end up placing the implant too mesial and too vertical to get a pterygoid implant and you get a tuber implant, which is placed in low quality bone. So first recommendation, fully guided surgery will allow you to get very good pterygoid implants. And pterygoid implants are a very good solution. Now you have to remember what I said in the earlier slide. All angulated implants lose more crystal bone and pterygoid implants and tuber implants are no different. They will lose more crystal bone due to oblique forces, something that was confirmed in a study published in early April 2020. So that is something to be considered. Another alternative are zygomatic implants. And they are called like that because, well, they go through the maxillary sinus or lateral to it in the extra maxillary technique and insert its apical portion in the zygomatic process. They have a good survival rate, but when they get infected, they're really, really complicated and messy to solve. They usually have a higher probing death, which can be misleading, and they suffer from the same diseases all angulated implants suffer from, which means they lose more crystal bone due to oblique forces and rotational elements. The prosthetic proposition of zygomatic implants is, in my opinion, not the best. These images have been taken from a company website and this company sells you on zygomatic implants being the solution for pretty much everything. But even though this is an extra maxillary technique, you can appreciate the problems that can arise 
uh, from a surgery like this and the level of invasiveness. So why would you submit your patients to something like this if you can do this in a much less invasive way with the same or even bigger predictability and attain more aesthetically pleasing restorations? Only grafts and implants. Well, only grafting can be used to restore bone volume either in the horizontal or even in the vertical. But in the vertical, just like TBR, they are not extremely predictable. And there is always the thing of handling large membranes that can be exposed and compromise the success of your graft. And so you can choose auto grafting, but there can be a lack of grafting material. You can choose bank bone blocks, but they are not always what they've been advertised to be. And synthetic bone blocks, which are nice, and some are very, very nice, but there's always this lack in relation to soft tissue. And soft tissue aesthetics is difficult and many times messy. And most of the time you will have to introduce secondary and tertiary procedures like uh, bone remodeling on soft tissue grafts. And so we get to science lifts and implants. The first uh, successful elevation techniques were described by Tatum, 76, and later published by Bonnie and James in the 80s. This means that we have been doing this for a very, very long time. And this also means things have changed. Implants have changed, graph materials have changed, techniques have changed. But there's a constant. The constant is, I need to place implants in a pneumatized maxillary sinus in order to restore and rehabilitate my patient to the best of my abilities. And I find myself having to deal with bone atrophy, pneumatization, and low quality bone due to absence of occlusal loads and vasculature reduction. So I need to fix this either at the time of implant placing or prior to it. In order to successfully and predictably perform sinus lifts, we need to remember sinus anatomy. So, a little history. Initially described by da Vinci in 1489, it was only described as such by Dr. Nathaniel Heimor in 1651 in its treatise Corporis Humani Disquisito Anatomica. And so, Hymer's antrum is the largest of uh, four air filled cavities located in the cranium. Its size has been described as 35 millimeters in height, 25 in transversal, and 32 on tube posterior, which means the volume should be around 28 cc's. It is described to be an outward looking pyramid that has its base in the medial wall, which is basically the outer wall of the nasal cavity. This pyramid has three main projections, the alveolar process inferiorly, the zygomatic recess, and the infraorbital process pointing superiorly. The sinus volume is very variable. It goes from 3.5 up to 35 cc's, with an average for men, 24 cc's, 
and 16 cc is for women. It does not seem to be any statistical difference between Anglo's classes, and it's not very influenced by malocclusions. And today's quick tip for us CSI fans, yes, it is true. Using forensic sciences, you can determine 90% of ethnicity and 80% gender just by looking at the maxillary sinus. How about that? The nasal lacrimal duct is one of the elements that should be considered while planning and performing sinus lifts. It runs in the anterior aspect of the medial wall. And if we perform a lateral window technique, we will access the medial wall while elevating the membrane. The nasal lacrimal duct has an outer wall that it's no more than a few tenths of a millimeter. And sometimes there is no wall, which means when we pack our graft material, we can pack inside the nasal lacrimal duct and create a ton of problems for the patient and for us in the long run. Another element to be considered is the osteum or osteomyital complex. The osteum is located in the superior aspect of the medial sinus wall. The diameter of the osteum is between two and six millimeters. And its function is to allow the mucus flow from the sinus to the nasal cavity by movement of the cilia. It needs to be correctly evaluated while planning our sinus lift surgery because an overpacking of our graft could block it and create the conditions for ARS or CRS, which in turn will mean that we will lose our graft. Human anatomy is variable, and so is the maxillary sinus. And it ranges from sinus oplasia, which is rare, but it's been described, to sinus hypoplasia, with a prevalence of 5 to 10%, or hyperneumatization, that has an 8% prevalence. And it actually leaves you pretty much with no bone to work with. Physiological age-related sinus pneumatization is known as the fourth expansion phenomenon of the sinus. As a recall, the first phenomenon starts at 10 weeks in utero, up to birth. The second one, childbirth to 12, 13 years old. The third one, 12, 13 years old, up to 20 years old, or full dentition. And of course, the fourth one, fourth one would be after tooth loss in the posterior maxilla. And it's considered a type of disuse based on atrophy. This, according to Wolf's Law of 1882, is due to a decreasing functional forces transferred to the bone after tooth loss, causing a shift in the remodeling process towards the bone resorption. Now, histologically, pneumatization process can be explained by an increased osteoclastic activity in the sinus membrane, resorption of the cortical sinus floor, and deposition of osteoid inferior to it. Hence, bone consisting of low trabecular, minimal cortical layers, and poor stress tolerance. So that leaves us with 
cilantro bone. And if we have cilantro bone, we have classifications. Cilantro classes would be SAC1 with a residual bone height of 10 or more millimeters. SAC2 between 5 and 10. And SAC3 less than 10. Now, the width of the alveolar crest ranges from 3.3 to 7.4 at molar sites, even in extreme atrophy, which is good for us. This is a representation of what Sharan presented in 2008 as a longitudinal study, uh, x-ray study, of patients after tooth extraction. And what it shows is that the original position of the sinus floor in relation to the apex determines how much bone loss you will have in a five-year period. And of course, it ranges from zero to four, being four, the most complicated, because if you lose 5.3 millimeters in that situation, you will end with well, nothing. Maxillary septa. The septa are bony crests inside the sinus. They were first described by Underwood, hence Underwood septa. Usually oriented in a medial towards lateral direction in 88%, horizontal 11% and sagittal 1%. They are classified into primary septa that arise from the development of the maxilla and secondary septa that arise uh, from irregular pneumatization of the maxillary sinus after tooth loss. The average of incidence is 41%. A meta-analysis of reports between 1910 and 2011 presented 7,061 sinuses analyzed in 19 studies, and at least one septa was present in 41% of the cases. Bilaterally, 17%. And when present, 25% was single septa and 4% multiple septa. The distribution is to the anterior basin 24%, middle basin 55%, and posterior basin 21%. As a comment, maxillary septa that run towards the lateral wall is higher near the medial wall than towards the lateral. The Schneider membrane is a pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium that covers the inner walls of the maxillary sinus. The mean thickness of it has been determined to be 0.9 millimeters with a range of 0.24 up to 3.5 millimeters while considered healthy. It can be elongated in a 124.7% while doing it in a two-dimensional way before burst. This is why we can do sinus elevation techniques that displace the membrane while stretching it without uh, provoking perforations. And as to be expected, thicker membranes are less prone to burst than thinner membranes. So let's talk about innervation. Sensor innervation of the sinus is supplied by the second branch of the fifth pair, and more specifically by the PSA, the ASA, the infraorbital nerve, and the greater palatine nerve. The MSA uh, contributes to secondary mucosal innervation. The innervation of the ostium is provided by the greater palatine nerve. Now, the parasympathetic innervation for secretion comes from the 
greater petrosal nerve, a branch of the facial nerve. The vasoconstrictor branches originate from the sympathetic carotid plexus. Blood vessels. The blood supply comes from branches of the internal maxillary artery, which are the infraorbital artery, lateral branches of the sphenopalatine and the greater palatine arteries, and in the floor, the PSA, the MSA, and the ASA arteries. Venous drainage runs anteriorly to the facial vein and posteriorly into the maxillary vein, jugular vein, and dural sinus system. The medial wall of the maxillary sinus drains into the sphenopalatine vein. In this image, we can appreciate the extraosseous anastomosis between the infraorbital artery and the PSA artery. Also, we should remember that in about 13% of the cases, there is direct contact between the infraorbital artery and the Schneider membrane due to absence of the bony wall. This is very important for us while um, attempting lateral window sinus elevation techniques. Lymphatic drainage is attained through connections of the um, pterygopalatine plexus to the eustachian tube and nasopharynx. Most of the drainage goes to the lateral cervical and retropharyngeal lymph nodes. So let's talk a minute about sinus ventilation. The ventilation is accomplished by simple gas exchange through the ostium and it takes between 5 and 20 minutes to accomplish this. Airspeed in the sinus is between 50 and 100 times slower than in the nose. And the temperature of the air is pretty much constant. And it's been recorded to be higher in the presence of ARS. We should also take notice that there is a higher concentration of nitric oxide, NO, uh, inside the maxillary sinus. The nitric oxide acts as an inhibitor for bacteria, fungus, and virus. And also, the NO is a stimulant for mucociliary activity. You can grow cultures from healthy sinuses, depending on the study, in about 20 to 100 percent cases. And the most common aerobic isolate is the beta hemolytic streptococcus. And on the anaerobic side is bacteroides. There is always some inflammatory cell infiltration in the submucosa, and that is pretty much a standard of normality in respiratory tissue. Sinus presents specific and non-specific defense mechanisms. Specific mechanisms, the mucociliary transport system. And non-specific, you get neutrophils and microphages and uh, the secretion of proteins. And uh, these proteins act as chemotectants for dendritic cells and T cells. And so you get an innate adaptive immune system. Mucociliary activity. Ciliated cells range from 91 to 98% around the sinus membrane. And globet cells are the mucus producers in this membrane. They do work a lot if you think they produce about two liters of mucus per day. And the uh, mucus is propelled in a very high speed, which is six millimeters per minute, which means you can renew all the uh, maxillary sinus mucus in about 
20 to 30 minutes. That is quite impressive. So we go in inside the sinus and change things around. What are the effects of this? Well, mucosal thickening, 74 to 89%, which means pretty much everybody. But only 4% gets persistent thickening. No morphological or ultrastructural changes to the mucosa have been detected in biopsies taken nine months past stop. And there are no studies that show alteration of mucociliary activity uh, when there is no alteration of the osteomyotal complex, which is very good. Maxillary sinus function. Let's talk about this for a minute. Well, when I was in dental school, they gave me a list and it looked pretty much like this one. So let's go one by one and see what's what. Number one, humidifying and warming inspired. It takes about 50 cycles to exchange the sinus volume, which is about 25 cc's. So no, I don't think so. Number two, regulating uh, intranasal pressure. And if you have an osteomyotal complex that's working fine, you have free flow. So yes, this could be a function. But there is risk of chronic disease and the body has to spend lots of resources for the sinus to work correctly. So there is something to consider there. Number three, increasing surface for the olfaction. Well, there are no olfactory cells in the sinus, or pretty much none. So I would say no. Four, lightening of the skull mass. Well, the mass reduction presented by the sinus would represent about 1%. So pros and cons, most likely not. Number five, resonance. Well, the um, sinuses are bad resonances. Uh, boxes because uh, post surgery you have altered ar architecture and the spectral analysis of the voice is pretty much the same. So there's no real work in that area. Six, absorbing shock. Okay, so airbags. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, but the bone design in the face and the pillars of the face have pretty much that job done. Number seven, contributing to facial growth. And this is the one, yes. It's believed that sinuses um, help develop facial form and they play a very active role in face um, contour development. So yes. Number eight, mucociliary propulsion of the mucus and serous secretions towards the osteum and then the exterior. Well, yeah, of course, ciliary cells represent, what, 98% of the Schneider membrane, so yes. And number nine, Thermal insulation. Well, even though the uh, temperature is quite stable, that is actually not really demonstrated yet. Since we are going to talk about pathophysiology of the maxillary sinus, I want to get something clear. Rhinosinusitis 
has replaced the uh, prior nomenclature of sinusitis. And it's derived from the swelling of the mucosa of the nose and the sinuses. It can be considered either chronic or acute, and the difference is basically a temporal one. Acute rhinosinusitis sets in four weeks, and chronic rhinosinusitis, 12 weeks. Okay, having clarified that, let's go into pathophysiology of the sinus. ARS and CRS are clearly pathologic conditions, and they must be recognized and treated before any sinus elevation procedure, either prior or in conjunction with dental implants. As with most uh, disease processes, etiologies are usually multifactorial. And in cases of ARS or CRS, referral to an appropriate ENT physician is essential. The etiologic underlying elements for CRS or ARS can be, number one, disruption of the mucociliary flow causing stagnation and uh, disrupting the normal drainage through the ostium. Number two, viral, bacterial, or non-invasive fungal infections to the upper respiratory tract. Number three, swelling and blockage of the osteomental complex due to allergic reaction and or infection. And four, Adentogenic sinusitis. Well, this is getting when it gets a little tricky. When I got into dental school, I was informed that adentogenic sinusitis represented about 5% of the cases. When I was in last year in dental school, it was already 10%. But recent studies show it could be between 25 and 75% of the cases. And of those, 48%, which means one in every two, will end in surgical maneuvers to get resolved. So this is something very important. So, since this is a short lecture, I've decided I'm not going to bore you anymore with sinus stuff, so I can bore you with something else. And something else. So, let's go with bone physiology. Bone physiology is something that we need to know, and the most important part is to know the difference between regeneration and repair. And basically, and the short is the short version is uh, regeneration is you do whatever you need to do in order to get full of functional tissue and repair well repair is what happens to us old guys i mean adults <laughs> uh, we get scar tissue if nothing is done we get a partially functional tissue, which is called scar. That pretty much acts as a little, uh, like a barrier. Okay, bone regeneration. And this is a little reminder of how things should go. First, we got trauma. Trauma means that we get a blood clot. And blood clot is basically a couple of cells mixed up in a fibrin-rich matrix that will fill completely the defect produced by the trauma. Second, components of this clot will migrate to surrounding tissue and attract some cells like neutrophils and monocytes. Once these cells have got inside the clot and start working, they will send signals that will induce the uh, 
formation of new blood vessels and the migration of fibroblasts. And with that, we no longer have a clot, we have granulation tissue. And granulation tissue will fill the defect temporarily. And in conjunction with the surrounding bone, things will be set for new bone formation. Okay, so new bone formation near the host bone and it will migrate towards the center of the lesion so we can get healing. Except this will not happen if the lesion exceeds critical size. And if it does, well, then we come in and we use osteoconductiveness to guide the new bone and um, uh, form bone in the injured area or grafted area. And this bone moves really, really fast, and of course it's immature, but it will heal. For this to happen, studies have shown we need basically blood vessels and a mechanically stable graft material so the uh, osteoblasts can do their work. So, once the regeneration process has started, mesenchymal cells in the graphic maxillary sinus will differentiate into osteoblasts if everything is fine. But if the graft is not mechanically stable or forces are applied to this graft, the cells will transform into fibroblasts and generate scar tissue or chondrocytes and generate cartilage or maybe a combination of both and you get fibrocartilage. So tension and compression, what is called hydrostatic stress, has to be controlled and your graph material needs to be mechanically stable. Okay, regeneration process is on its way. But you need oxygen to keep things working. That means angiogenesis. And in bone grafts, the angiogenesis and its healer events are preserved from matrix regression to forming fully functional capillaries. You also get vasculogenesis, which is, which means marrow derived uh, progenitor cells are attracted to the site and they add to these endothelial cells, which are forming blood vessels. So now we have our bone graft and angiogenesis is on the way, and bone formation is on the way, but we have a problem. Hypoxia has already set inside the graft, and that induces a catabolic state by stimulating the osteoclasts. And this osteoclast will try to eat your graft. And for this to stop, you need oxygen. Once angiogenesis is complete, you get oxygen. Once you do, an anabolic state may set in and bone formation begins. And this will heal and colonize your graft or injury. And then you're done. Or so you should think so. But then there is bone modeling. And bone modeling is the macroscopic changes that will occur in time due to imbalance between osteoclastic bone resorption and osteoblastic bone formation. So the later changes you see on your sinus lifts are due to bone modeling. 
And bone remodeling is basically uh, the part in charge of keeping or altering the bone density. Okay, so bone quality, remodeling. Okay, so now you have a fully healed graft and we're done. So what happens next? Well, according to Frost, you have to keep hydrostatic pressure, which means contract compression or traction, inside the physiological limits. Because if you go over the physiological limits, you will have overload and eventually uh, pathological overload and loose bone. And if you don't have enough uh, hydrostatic pressure, you will go into disuse atrophy. I don't know if you remember that, but that is what happens when you have tooth loss. So what's important is to keep things inside the physiological limits and do not let the history of this uh, graft be plagued with overloads and underloads. Now we have placed our implants inside the grafted uh, sinus. And basically, when you place implants in vital bone and these implants get into function, the forces applied to the implant are transferred to surrounding bone. And this bone will recognize the biomechanical needs. This recognition of biomechanical needs, it's done by the osteocytes. That will basically read what's going on and determine how much bone is needed around the implant to keep things working fine. Of course, this is while inside physiological limits. If you overload your implants, you will lose them. Okay, and you will lose bone if implants are not in function. The larger the initial bone remnant you have, the smaller the transfer of loads between implant and bone. And so your catabolic state will sit in longer until the balance is reached. And so you will lose more bone graft. While partially resolvable grafting materials will obscure this vision, in the long run, using slower resolvable materials or somewhat slower resorbable materials and not autogenous bone will provide a more positive result. In grafted sinuses, bone regeneration forms new bone closer to the host bone towards the Schneiderian membrane. And you can describe this as a relation between bone and graft material really, uh, relative to distance from the host bone. This is called the graft consolidation gradient. Okay, so graft consolidation gradient can be expressed in these graphs. If we can read these graphs correctly, we will understand that region one, which is closer to the bone, to the host bone, begets lots of new formed bone. And this new formed bone decreases very rapidly towards the region three, which is the farthest away. And if we go to the lower graphs, we see that the percentage of, in this case, BIOS, which is the blue line, um, stays pretty much stable towards, from region one to, towards region three. 
And austin, which is a fastly resorbable material, okay, synthetic material, which, because it's nano, um, nano hydroxyapatite. Um, it practically disappears from region one and stays pretty much the same as you go inwards. So this means we should probably use somewhat faster materials than BIOS, even though BIOS works very well. This is our updated uh, Max Higher Science Graft Options. So in one side we have autographs and on the other side alloplasts. And in addition, we have biologic uh, growth factors, which I'm really not going to talk about right now because this is not the objective of this lecture. Uh, and so what I wanted to say is we can do in the sinus pretty much everything with alloplasts. We actually don't really need pretty much any, any autographs. And, well, the idea is to present to you um, in the next slide the choice for alloplasts. Well, this lecture is part of a series of lectures that will take us towards DIVA implant systems. And I want to present to you the um, graph material that's used in the EVA systems, which is beta tricalcium phosphate inside a hyaluronic acid gel. And the most important um, property of this uh, material is that it sets. It sets uh, in sort of a grid which gives you a macropore structure that resists sedimentation and supports the material uh, so you get less compression. So it's biometrically stable. And this macropore structure allows rapid cell growth and it's proven to enhance angiogenesis and therefore osteogenesis. And there is a recent study that shows that this kind of material inhibits connective tissue influx and promotes the osteoconductive regeneration of critical size defects, which is actually exactly what we need. So our time is up, and I want to thank you all for bearing with me through this lecture that has set the basis for sinus elevation techniques. And I hope to see you soon in our next lecture that will take us from evaluation to diagnosis to planning to execution and prevention of complications of sinus lifts. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Okay, and so we're back. I want to thank you, all of you, because you endured this lecture. I know it was dense and somewhat slow, but, well, the basics normally are. And so, thank you. I, I swear, next lecture, there will be blood. That's what surgeons like. I do like it. So there will be. Uh, so questions. Okay. Uh, which bone substitute you use often? Okay. Um, well, for Diva implants, I use the one which is provided by the company, which is um, uh, better tricalcium phosphate inside this um, hyaluronic acid gel. And for 
everything else, everything else, I use uh, EasyGraft from, well, what used to be degradable solution, Switzerland, now Sunstar Japan. But it's a very nice synthetic material that allows me to uh, use, well, uh, I can use it in pretty much everything. And it's uh, membrane free. And okay, another question. How do you choose the substitute? Okay. Um, well, as I said, I pretty much use this material, EC Graft, uh, since uh, 2011. I haven't, I actually haven't used pretty much anything else uh, since then. And we do volume grafts and sinus lifts when we do open window. And we do uh, uh, RGB, GBR, and uh, also we do uh, well, pretty much everything with implants, without implants, as a restoration, as a preservation. And so uh, we only have the difference between the EasyGraph Crystal, which is uh, partially non resorbable material, and the Seagraph Classic, which is a 100% turnover. And the difference in the end is, uh, well, will this site undergo ortho, ortho tantex or, uh, well, that is the real difference, actually. And the other difference is, will I need or do I want more bone? Uh, ECGRAF Crystal gets me more bone than the material that I place. And it's, yes, thank you for the question. It's an alloplast. Uh, it's completely synthetic. And it's, uh, well, uh, self-stabilized because every particle that's uh, involved or covered with a, with a um, polyglycolic uh, acid. And after it's been activated, it turns into a putty and then it sets in position. And so it gets a net of uh, polyglycolic acid. Uh, no, thank you for the question. I don't use membranes. Is this uh, polyglycolic acid membrane uh, net stabilizes the graft and uh, then while it's stable, you don't get Fibrist, uh, fibroblast ingrowth, which is why you choose or why you lose your uh, grafts. And there is no need for membranes, so there is no need for tacks or sutures or very large flaps. Okay, so uh, for GBR with this graft, you don't use membrane? Nope. Uh, this material is self contained. Uh, is self-stabilized and uh, has a very uh, very high degree of mechanical pressure, hydrostatic pressure resistance. And so, no, we don't use it. Uh, we don't have uh, fibroblast infiltration and that is very nice. For DIVA is PETA TCP. Do you have any special instructions? Uh, actually, uh, no, the material comes ready, uh, ready to inject. Uh, even the cannula, it's provided by the uh, by Paltop to go through the implant inside the sinus. And the gel is self-setting, uh, glides inside the implant very nicely, and it packs itself through the breathing motion of the patient when you have uh, preserved membranes. And the other advantage of this uh, material is that uh, it's cohesive, which means if you have a small tear, it just won't run out, take off and run out and get inside the sinus. Well, it, get, uh, it will partially maybe get inside the sinus, but it will stay there, um, fixed to the rest of the graft. And the membrane will eventually cover it and you will have no no real complications. Actually, uh, we have discovered that uh, lately when we take x-rays, post-op x-rays long term, uh, our sinuses are in very, con um, in, in, in very condition than when initially. 
uh, we had the CBCG taken and maybe we had some uh, Schneider membrane thickness. And now it's better than before. Okay, question. Diva prosthetic parts are special. No, actually, no. This is one of the best things of this uh, brand of implants. It's restored like any internal hex. I would recommend, of course, the use of uh, private parts, I mean, made by Palto, which have the best uh, adjustment over a uh, Palto implant. Uh, they are actually quite nice, and you have the whole range from tie base to angle correction uh, to traditional cement developments and multi units and single units. So you have everything you need. And are you going to talk about Diva Protocol? Well, this is these four lectures are designed to take us to the um, use of Diva in terms of surgical uh, determination and uh, well i'm going to show a couple of surgeries and so you can uh, see actually in the in the real time that actually for uh, right now it takes up about uh, 12 minutes to do a implant and a science lift so right now we pretty much just look at the x-rays check out the cdcts and okay implant here implant here implant here implant here and done now okay we go with a with a window and we make bone and then uh, no we just okay there there and there and it's it's very it's very simple very straightforward actually it's not simple but it's very straightforward uh has a very very good uh, learning curve and well uh, we have been placing Diva for what three almost four years now and in Chile uh, there is only one loss of Diva implants only one which is mine and it's not a real loss that didn't have any initial stability so I decided not to place it that's the only case the rest that have been placed are already restored or either in restored and in also integration period but uh we we have a very high high degree of success with this uh, type of implants and so i don't uh, see any more questions so okay i want to thank you all again for bearing with me and uh, okay, I, I gave you my emails and WhatsApp if you need, need or want to contact me. And uh, next lecture, which is on the 30th of April, will be uh, evaluation, diagnosis, uh, planning, executing, and uh, um, the, bad, the bad part complications of sinus lift techniques. Again, Thank you very much for coming, and I hope to see you soon. Take care, stay safe, let's fight the virus.